Most speaker boxes, they suck. So what makes a speaker box suck? It's not the drivers, it's the flimsy enclosure, flexing, and leaking. Today, I'm building a concrete bookshelf speaker to make the box stronger and more acoustically accurate. And I'll show you exactly how I designed and built it. The problem? Most cheap speaker boxes are built from flimsy material, and that's a problem in a system that has to handle a lot of energy. In a perfect world, almost all of that energy would go into pushing air and making sound. In reality, we already lose some to heat and friction, but we also waste a bunch flexing the box itself. When the enclosure moves, it adds its own delayed and muddy sound on top of the music. So my goal was simple build a cabinet that really doesn't want to flex without resorting to giant slabs of one inch hardwood. And that's why I turned to the same material holding up a lot of the world's tallest buildings, concrete. Now, designing a box for MDF construction is fairly straightforward. Designing one for concrete, that's where it gets weird. Yes, there are 3D printers that will do concrete, but they are for printing houses and not a pair of desktop speakers. So for this build, I'm going old school, molds and a pour, and that all starts in CAD. I sketch the overall shape, then drop in rough models of the woofer, tweeter, and even the crossover so that I can check all my clearances, mounting points, and wiring paths before I ever touch any concrete. There is one big constraint. If I poured a fully closed six-sided box around an inner mold, I would never get that mold back out. So this design is five sides in concrete and a removable cap. The cap does double duty. It's a 3D printed glass fiber PLA wave diffuser at about 12 millimeters thick, backed with a 12 millimeter hardwood panel that holds up the terminals for amp hookup. Once the enclosure looks right in CAD, it's time to turn that shape into molds. So this project actually uses two different mold setups. One speaker is a three-part mold and the other is a four-part mold, both wrapped around an inner core. It all starts in CAD. I add a draft to the inner walls and the outer walls so that the concrete should slide out instead of vacuum locking. At least that was the theory. I also added a big handle to the inner core so there's something solid to pull on. And that part worked really great. On the outside, I built tongue and groove alignment features so the mold halves would register cleanly. That detail is going to matter a lot later when we attempt to demold these. Now, to get from a digital mold to something you can actually pour concrete into, a 3D printer is kind of the perfect tool. If you don't have a printer, PCBWay, who are sponsoring this video, can print molds like that straight from your CAD files. As part of their Christmas sale, 3D printing starts at about $4.89 per part, with 10% off materials, plus deals on clear resins such as UTR8100, and up to 50% off select services through the end of the year. So if you've got a weird idea like concrete speakers, check them out at the link below and get it made before the holidays are up. Now, once the molds were printed, they still needed some prep before we can pour any concrete into them. I hit them with sanding and a few rounds of filler primer to knock down the layer lines. That does two things. It gives the concrete a smoother, more polished finish, and it removes all those tiny ridges that like to mechanically lock the part to the mold. And with the molds printed, smooth, and assembled, we are ready for the fun and slightly stressful part, mixing concrete and finding out if this design actually works. Now, go ahead and place your bets in the comments. How many problems do you think I'm about to run into with this pour? Regular cement is full of chunky aggregate, which is great for driveways, but terrible for 10 millimeter walls on speaker enclosures. So instead, I used a self-leveling floor compound, the same stuff I used to fill the walls on my eight inch woofer box. Check the video out on the channel. If it can handle foot traffic, a pair of desktop speakers is no problem. To get ready for the pour, I assembled the molds and sealed the seams with captain tape. 
A 3D printed jig centers the central plug and clamps the outer mold together. The four part version also has a base that the side walls slot into with screws and silicone to lock it in. Unfortunately, I built the tongue and groove backwards on that one and I wouldn't discover that until I demold. Now, before mixing anything, I wiped the molds down with isopropyl alcohol and then hit everything with mold release spray. And the pour itself is pretty straightforward. You add water until it flows nicely and there are tools to measure the consistency. But at this point, I kind of just go by feel. And the one big mistake I made was using a power mixer, which whips a ton of air into the mix. And I really should have thrown it in a vacuum chamber to degas it first. And you'll see why in a second. And I poured the bottom up to just below the speaker cutouts so there wouldn't be voids hiding under the inner core and then dropped the central plug in, locked it with a retainer and the plug being lighter than concrete immediately tried to float. So I taped it down and put a 25 pound dumbbell on top while it cured. And once it set up, the inner plug just pulled right out. The handle did its job really well and that's when problem number one showed up. The back side was riddled with air pockets, which probably means the walls are full of tiny voids too. It's not ideal, but I did decide to press forward. And then came the real problem, getting the outer molds off. Both the three-part and the four-part molds refused to release. The big issue was the driver cutouts only had about a half a degree of draft and the openings just locked into the shell. On the four part mold, the backwards tongue and groove trapped the pieces together instead of sliding away. So I pried it apart and split the enclosure cleanly into two pieces. The earlier three part version went even worse. Off camera, after a few choice words, I tried to smack it free on the table and it exploded into about six chunks. And at that point, both enclosures needed JB weld surgery and I stitched the pieces back together from the inside, clamped them while the epoxy cured, and then ground and sanded the outside back to a clean shape. So have you ever tried sanding concrete? I don't recommend it unless you hate free time because the concrete wins. And after way too many hours, both enclosures were sanded up to about a thousand grit and they are stupid smooth. And now it's time to turn these blocks into actual speakers. First up, the inside acoustics. I designed a 3D printed wave diffuser for the back wall behind the woofer to break up any reflections. And then to warm up the look, I cut half inch wood panels on the new Galvo laser. And that's where problem number three showed up. The Galvo cut through fine, but the beam isn't perfectly vertical. So the cuts came out slightly tapered and the plates would not sit flush. That ultimately meant more hand fitting and sanding to make them nest cleanly into the concrete enclosures. Once they did, I added a little hidden detail. I engraved the project name, Stone Cold Sounds, and some polarity symbols on the back side of the rear covers. And with the back sorted, I had to solve the how do you bolt drivers into concrete without chipping the edges problem. Concrete anchors felt risky with how thin the walls are around the cutouts. So instead, I printed small interior blocks, pressed threaded inserts into them, and glued those blocks inside the enclosure. The screws passed through the concrete into the inserts, so the driver frame and the printed mounts clamp the wall from both sides, and it spreads that load and the last piece, the crossover. I'm using a pre-built 3,500 Hz two-way network. So I printed a small bracket, soldered and crimped wiring while it printed, and then bolted the crossover on and glued the bracket to the floor of the enclosure just behind the four inch driver. And with the wiring done, the hardware mounted, we can finally assemble everything and find out if these concrete boxes sound as good as they look. It's finally time to turn these concrete shells into actual speakers. I start at the back, First, dry fit the 3D printed diffuser to make sure everything seats properly. Once I'm happy with the fit, I mix up two part epoxy and coat the back wall so the diffuser bonds and seals the enclosure airtight. Then I butter the back of the diffuser with epoxy as well. And that's what the half inch wood back plate 
will glue to. And between the concrete, the diffuser, and the wood, the rear ends up way thicker and stiffer than the 10 millimeter sides. Before I press the wood on for good though, I install the rear terminals, simple M4 bolts through the plate. They double as binding posts and they're easy to seal. Just dip them in epoxy and pull them through. With the back closed up, it was time to go fishing. I reach inside and pull the tweeter and full range leads through their respective cutouts. I'll double check the polarity so we do not repeat my oopsie from the ChatGPT speaker build. And once the wiring checks out, I use blue tack sealing around the tweeter and the driver and cinch them down with M4 screws. And that gives us a compressible gasket so that the box stays airtight. So the next problem, how do you actually point these at your ears? They're flat on the bottom. And so I measured the listening distance to my monitor and then checked my ear height at my desk. And then I used a bit of very rusty trigonometry to figure out the angle that would aim the drivers right at my ear line. And for the stands, I went back to the laser and cut profiles from eighth inch MDF. My original plan was a full stacked lamination wood stand, but shop reality kicked in. I had a lot of MDF and not so much hardwood. So I printed a solid wedge as the core and then glued MDF sides to it and then finished it in a white oak veneer. With a quick sand and a few coats of butcher block oil, the stands look like solid wood without the time or cost. And with that, we've got concrete enclosures on angled wood stands. The drivers are bolted in and everything is sealed up. On paper, this should be much stiffer and much cleaner and better sounding than the average MDL bookshelf. But that's all theory until we actually listen to them. So let's fire these up and see what concrete speakers really sound like. So compared to the big line arrays, these are replacing. These concrete boxes hit noticeably harder in the low end, but without that way too loud at 20% volume problem, these feel punchier and more focused, especially around the desk at normal listening levels. And if you're into overbuilt DIY speaker projects like this, consider hitting like and subscribe. It really does help push videos like this out to more people. And now let's see if REW agrees on my opinions. Okay, graph time. I did two sets of REW sweeps. One near field with the mic close to the drivers and one out at my actual listening position about three feet away. The near field curve mostly tells us what the driver and the concrete box are doing on their own. Once we get above 120 hertz, it stays pretty smooth with a gentle rise through the mid bass and a slow tilt down towards the top end, but no crazy spikes and no deep holes, which is honestly what I was worried about with air pockets in the concrete. And now out in the room, the far field trace still looks surprisingly sane. From about 100 to 200 hertz, there's a little mid bass bump. So the kick and bass have some extra punch. The mids from roughly 500 to 2000 hertz also stay pretty flat and that top end from 5 to 10 lifts a few decibel which adds air and detail without getting too harsh. The big win is what isn't there. No huge nulls, no nasty resonances that scream bad box or weird reflections. And for a first try concrete enclosure with zero DSP and a cheap off the shelf crossover, this is absolutely in the zone where a little tiny EQ could make it really nice. But even straight off the amp, it already sounds more controlled and solid than the flimsy boxes I smashed at the beginning or the line arrays that I'm replacing. And that is how you design, build, and assemble a speaker enclosure that does not suck. If you enjoyed this build, or you want to see me push this even further with DSP, different materials, or a version two of these boxes, consider subscribing drop a comment telling me what you'd build a speaker out of next. And that feedback really helps me decide what projects to tackle 
next. And thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys next time.